So can everyone hear me? Morgan, would you like to put your video on and come into the call? Hello everyone and welcome to our um, Zoom webinar where we're speaking with Professor Morgan Pratchett from James Cook University at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. Um, so people can hear me in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, so my name is David Casalino and um, I work for the Australian Marine Conservation Society. And um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today. So all across Australia, we're gathered on um, the land of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've been um, you know, looking after our, uh, this country for tens of thousands of years um, and can continue to play an important role in movement to protect our environment all throughout um, the, the country. Um, a special acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the sea country of the Great Barrier Reef, um, and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. And so, um, thank you so much for everyone sounding off in the chat. Um, so please continue to um, put through comments, questions as they come through. Um, today is uh, incredibly important um, uh, time for us to chat about what's happening with our beautiful Great Barrier Reef. So, um, you know, in the midst of the awful pandemic of coronavirus, um, you know, uh, that uh, where everyone is struggling to cope with the health and ec economic fallout uh, from this virus, um, Unfortunately, we've seen the Great Barrier Reef bleach in a, uh, for the third time in five years. And so I know myself and many people have a lot of questions about what this means uh, for our reef right now and into the future. And so we're really lucky to be able to be joined by Professor Morgan Pratchett. And so we're gonna bring him on soon to start his presentation. Hi Morgan, thanks for having coming here. Um, I'll, but first, we, before we get there, I'll get through the agenda of today. So we're going to hear from Morgan in a presentation that he's prepared based on the latest data. And then throughout that time, if you can be thinking of questions that you want to ask him, put them into the chat um, on Zoom or on Facebook, wherever you're joining us from. And then I'll do my best to collect those questions at the end and, uh, and have a question and answer session with Morgan. After the question and answer session, um, we're going to take a bit of action together. And so we know that, you know, to protect the reef into the future, we're going to need bold action on climate change. And um, our governments are the custodians of the reef, so they need to be leading on this. So I'm going to be calling the Prime Minister's office on my phone um, with you all live. And we're going to ask him um, to use this opportunity with, you know, stimulus packages to respond to the economic fallout of COVID to, um, you know, invest in renewable energy and the clean industries that are going to protect our reef into the future. And so after that, we're going to have enough chance for then after the call for you guys to go and call your MPs because MPs everywhere need to know how much we love the reef and want to protect its future. And then we'll wrap things up and it'll all be done by 1.30. So um, I think that is good to go then. Hello to everyone joining. If you're just joining, my name's David. I'm from the Australian Marine Conservation Society. We're here today live with Morgan Pratchett, a professor um, at the James Cook University in Townsville. And we'll be answering your questions on the Great Barrier Reef's coral bleaching event that's just happened over the summer of 2020. Um, devastating news for our reef. Um, there's some glimmers of hope in there with prime tourist sites avoiding the worst of the bleaching. And we're gonna hear all about the details um, from Professor Morgan in just a few minutes. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming here. Um, we can't do anything without you guys and um, the support is always beautifully welcome. Um, so we're going to get started in just a few minutes in terms of the actual presentation. Um, just checking that we've got all our um, tech ready to go. Morgan just left the chair. Um, we'll get Morgan to... Um, start sharing his screen and making sure that we're ready with the PowerPoint presentation um, in about a minute's time. In the meantime, for those on Zoom, we've got a poll that we can answer where you're joining us from. We've got people from all around Australia, people coming from Queensland, New South Wales, the biggest ones. And we've also got people um, from places other from outside of Australia, which is exciting. So welcome to people from all around the world listening in. We had um, 600 RSVPs to this event on Loom, and we're going to have thousands more on Facebook, hopefully. So welcome to everyone. Okay, so Morgan, your video is working now. I'm seeing the screen. Um, 
if you want to get off mute and take it away um, with your presentation. And then when you're finished, I'll jump back on and field questions from everyone else. So thank you, everyone. Um, have a silent round of applause from our homes for Professor Morgan Pratchett from the Arc Centre of Excellence for Coral Studies at James Cook University. We're really pleased to be able to have you here. So thank you so much for taking the time with us, Morgan. Over to you. Thank you very much, David, and um, thank you to the Australian Marine Conservation Society. Oh, we can't hear you, Morgan. Okay. Um, I'm definitely unmuted. No, goodness. still nothing. This isn't working. Oh, other people can hear him. Okay. That's good. Is our thing turning out? Maybe keep going. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you to the um, Australian Marine Conservation Society for this opportunity. So I'm going to be talking about um, what's been happening on the Great Barrier Reef in the last couple of months, um, giving you a bit of an overview of two different um, sets of surveys. The first being aerial surveys that were conducted by Professor Terry Hughes from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, and also some in-water surveys that we've been conducting to complement those aerial surveys. Just before I get started, I'll just give you um, a bit of an introduction to the environmental conditions, specifically the accumulated heat stress on the Great Barrier Reef um, that's occurred in these last couple of months. Um, so what this graph shows is data from the um, United States organization, NOAA, and it's the accumulation of heat stress, specifically the um, increase in temperature for a given location and time across this region. And you're looking at the Queensland coastline where you can see the outline of the Great Barrier Reef close into that gray part of the coastline. And this is just cycling through from January right through to the end of March. And you'll see that the actual heat really started to kick in from sort of the middle of February onwards. And by the time we get to the end of this video um, in late March, you can see that there was a lot of heat accumulated over this large area. Now I'll come back to exactly um, what this means in terms of the specific values, but this is degree heating weeks. And I'll give you some context for this later on in the talk. But at the end of March, you can see that there were a lot of areas across the Great Barrier Reef and out into the Coral Sea where we had a lot of heat accumulated in this system. Now, just another way of looking at that um, is to emphasize that February was actually the hottest February ever recorded. So this is um, data from Australia's Bureau of Meteorology and the bars just show the temperature anomaly just for February, all the way going back to 1900. And you can see, if you can see my cursor, the value for February 2020 just stands out showing that this was a, an unprecedented event in terms of the temperature in February. Now, the key thing from all this is that at the start of this summer, um, late in 2019, we were actually thinking that it was going to be a relatively normal or cool year and we weren't anticipating any major bleaching, but the heat accumulated so quickly at the start of the year that we ended up in a situation where there was sufficient heat to, um, to induce a major bleaching event. And it's the same event, the, the warming in this part of the world, the rapid increase in temperature around February that led to the severity of the bushfires that we've seen um, in Australia as well. So once we were um, pretty clear that there was a concern regarding the corals on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Terry embarked, Terry Hughes, that is Professor Terry Hughes from the ARC Centre of Excellence, embarked on aerial surveys that he's been conducting right back to um, 2016 when we had the, uh, the first major bleaching event of this series. And the benefit of doing aerial surveys is that you can just get to so many more reefs. So there's over 2000 reefs on the Great Barrier Reef um, and we can't possibly visit all those reefs within the you know, limited period of time that, uh, where bleaching occurs unless you use aerial surveys. So Terry in the most recent event um, flew over more than 1,000 reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. And from the air, you can see the incidence of corals bleaching. So this is an image taken from the Keppels where that very 
white area on the very sort of southernmost, the bottom part of that reef there is uh, very high coral cover where you can see most of it is actually bleached. So based on this, he scores the, the individual reefs um, into four different categories. And from that, you can look at the spatial footprint of the bleaching event. Um, we're not gonna focus too much on how severe the bleaching was at any given location, but we just divide it into reefs for, this per for the initial purpose of um, showing the extent of the bleaching. We look at the reefs where there was virtually no bleaching observable versus those where the bleaching was in the most severe category. Now, just to give you some context, uh, these are those maps that were created for the events in 2016 and 2017, again, based on the same aerial survey methodology and also conducted by Professor Terry Hughes and also James Kerry now at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And the red um, spots on this, these graph, these maps show the reefs where bleaching was most severe whereas the green dots show the reefs where there was no or negligible coral bleaching. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the patterns um, as they were reported in 2016 and 2017, but in 2016, the bleaching was really restricted to the areas north of Cairns. Um, in 2017, the, the footprint of the areas that were most severely affected by the bleaching then was slightly further south mostly between Cairns and Townsville. I will draw your attention, however, to the lack of red dots in the southernmost part of the Great Barrier Reef. So all these areas right down south in the previous major mass bleaching events in 2016 and 2017 were largely spared from any major bleaching effect. So, I'll now show you the results for 2020. Um, and so this is the latest graph, the latest map. Terry literally only finished doing these surveys in the last couple of weeks. The surveys both in the air and in the water were conducted over two weeks in late March. And you, straight away, you can see that the footprint of the bleaching is quite different. So fortunately, many of these areas that were worst affected up in the northern parts of the Great Barrier Reef have been spared this time. But we do, for the first time out of these three events, see severe bleaching on reefs in the south. Now, in this event, severe coral bleaching has been recorded across the entire length of the Great Barrier Reef. So that makes this the most widespread of the three bleaching events. Now there's clear differences in where the bleaching was most severe. Um, and the fortunate thing you can see here is that in some of these places such as the reefs off Cairns, there's been relatively little bleaching in the most recent events. So that's, that's the areas where the, a lot of the Cairns-based tourism um, and also the operators out of Port Douglas um, rely on. And so those areas were largely spared in this latest event, but they were quite severely impacted in 2016 and 2017. But since that time, there's been some recovery. So the worst bleaching that we actually recorded underwater was in that area between Townsville and Cairns. And you can see based on the aerial surveys, pretty much all the reefs that they um, recorded um, from the air had severe bleaching as well. So moving to what, was, what we witnessed when we went underwater, this is a, a video taken from Yamakata Reef, which is just north of Townsville. It's a mid-shelf reef. And this is a video that I took on the 23rd of March, um, one of the last reefs we visited before we had to come back to Townsville. And what you're seeing here is a lot of either white or pale colored acropora corals, which are clearly showing signs of bleaching. So some of these corals stand out that they're, they're still colorful, but they're not the rich dark colors we expect of these corals. So even when you're seeing these pale colors, it is a clear sign of stress. 
So based on this, you can see that the majority of these corals, I know that this video is just taken from the top of the reef, are showing signs of bleaching. And in particular, all the branching corals, which belong to the, the taxonomic group we refer to as Aquapora, are pretty much bleached. Uh, sorry. And that. Oh, sorry about that. Just trying to get to the next slide. Okay, so the important thing I need to emphasize is that so far all we have documented for 2020 is the extent of actual bleaching. Now what I'm showing now is the data going back to 2016 which shows the actual change in coral cover. So this is coral mortality attributable to those bleaching events based on surveys that were conducted during the bleaching in early 2016 and comparing the amount of coral we get on those same reefs at approximately the same locations to, through to the end of 2016. So this is the actual measurement of coral mortality. And remembering that the bleaching was most severe in the northern parts of the Great Barrier Reef during that particular year of bleaching, you can see that in those areas that were worst affected, we had um, coral mortality up to in, and exceeding 80% on some of those reefs. So given the, the severe, severe bleaching this time is largely in the south, we might expect to see similar levels of coral mortality in some of those other places where we've seen severe bleaching at this stage, but it's really too early to tell how much coral might be lost due to this recent event. Um, I will, however, point you to this data, which is one of the um, outputs from a paper, one of many papers that um, Terry and the group published as a result in, um, following the 2016 and 2017 bleaching events. And what this does is relate the amount of mortality to the extent of the accumulated heat stress. So that degree heating weeks that I talked about previously. So if you just look at the plot on the far left there, we look at the amount of mortality just recorded during the actual bleaching event. And there was still some significant mortality recorded when we did the bleaching surveys showing the severity of that event. But then the second plot looks at the change in coral cover. So this is a more accurate estimate of the overall coral mortality related to the bleaching events. The, the figure labeled B is relating it to the severity of the bleaching in terms of the proportion of corals that bleached and the figure on your far right is relating it to the degree heating weeks. Now, you can see that once you get above a degree, about six degree heating weeks, there is the potential for some significant coral loss occurring as a result of those events. So just bear in mind that there are a lot of areas on the Great Barrier Reef and out into the Coral Sea that have experienced well in excess of six degree heating weeks in 2020. So we do expect to see um, a high level of mortality on some reefs. So, Based on that, and I know this is just a very preliminary overview of this data, remembering, oops, very sorry, <laughs> remembering that this um, data has only just been um, collected. Um, we, we are envisaging um, working this data up as fast as we possibly can and hope to produce some more rigorous peer reviewed papers towards the middle or end of this year. But based on what we're seeing so far and remembering this is now the third major mass bleaching event affecting the Great Barrier Reef in just the last five years, the conclusions that I really want to, you to take away from this are that coral reefs um, and especially the reef building corals are obviously extremely vulnerable to elevated ocean temperatures um, as evidence from the, the widespread and severe mass bleaching event. Now, oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening there. Um, the recurrent episodes of mass bleaching that we're seeing, you know, 
This is now the third bleaching event in just five years. So the, the time between these major disturbances is literally just a few years. This time period does not allow time for coral assemblages to recover. So if we continue to see these events occurring with this frequency, it will certainly lead to long-term degradation of the Great Barrier Reef and other reef systems. Um, and so based on, on this evidence, we can really now point to the fact that climate change is the foremost threat to coral reefs. There are a lot of other pressures affecting the reef, which also we need to continue to focus on addressing. But we need now to act to reduce the severity of this, these bleaching events. And really the only way to do that is to reduce the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Morgan. And round of applause silently from all around the world um, for that presentation. We really appreciate it. And um, really nailed the timing too. So excellent work there, we're bang on time. Um, apologies to people for our minor tech issues with Zoom. Um, hopefully people have got the link now to our Facebook Live where um, the same video is being um, screened right this second. Um, so we've had a bunch of questions come through um, in relation to uh, the presentation. So are you all ready for some questions, Morgan? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so there were some questions around um, the differences between the different bleaching events um, from a number of people, including uh, Madison um, in Zoom, about you know the, the reefs that experienced really severe bleaching in 2016 or 2017, and then avoided bleaching this year. Like, what does it mean for those corals? So. It's, it is reassuring that in some of the areas which bleached in 2016 and 2017, we have seen some really good um, coral recovery, probably better recovery than we actually expected. And now for those reefs that haven't bleached in this event, that recovery will continue. But some of those reefs have bleached again, and that is likely to reset the, the recovery or undo any of the recovery that's occurred over the last few years. Now, at the scale of the entire Great Barrier Reef, it is very clear that there is some reefs still which have very high coral cover and haven't experienced really severe coral loss due to bleaching as yet. But I'm sure you can all appreciate that given the scale of these events and now the fact that we're seeing them occurring so frequently, it's really clear that unless we do something about emissions, climate change is gonna have a significant impact on the reef as a whole. Great, thank you. Um, so we now have a question um, from, uh, we've got one from Tanya. So uh, the question is, will emissions reductions due to coronavirus um, with you know, planes and other transport things grounded offer any respite to our reef and buy us some more time? Well, yeah, there's a lot of evidence out there showing that emissions have drastically been reduced as a result of the shutdowns linked to the coronavirus. So the fact that there's virtually no international air travel is a good thing. But this is just a very temporary respite. And some of the modelling suggests that it's not going to have any long-term effects on the greenhouse system unless we actually make fundamental changes as we come out of this current situation. So what we should all be doing at this point in time is taking stock of the sorts of changes that we can actually live with, which are gonna be better for the planet as a whole moving forward. Here, here. Um... And we've seen in other sort of economic declines over the years, like with the global financial crisis in 2008, that emissions actually went up a heap afterwards, like uh, in, even more than before the crisis is, you know, polluting industries like the fossil fuel industry crank up again. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not all good news, but yeah, I agree. Let's take this time to restock and, you know, use some of this, um, you know, government stimulus that's now lying around to, um, you know, invest in those cleaner industries like renewable energy and others that will be able to, you know, uh, reduce emissions and protect the future of our reef. Um, so um, just trying to get, manage all these different questions. Everyone's really lo loving this. Um, we've got some questions, um, quite a specific question from Maria about um, 
the bleaching around Heron Island. We've seen a lot of photos um, recently about from that area. Um, do you want to comment briefly on that one, Morgan? Um, unfortunately, I can't really say too much about what happened in the water down south. It was our intention once we finished the northern surveys to keep going south, but unfortunately, due to the shutdown of James Cook University as a consequence of the coronavirus, we weren't able to do any further surveys to the south. Now, there is a lot of other anecdotal information coming in, which shows that the bleaching certainly did happen on reefs around Heron, but I can't really comment on the severity of it based on in-water surveys without seeing it myself. No worries. Um, and so this question has come up uh, a bit in my personal experience and also in, in today about um, whether, um, uh, you know, it's possible that uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, coral will um, move south, um, as you know, we've seen the southern section avoid bleaching previously. Is that is there any merit to that? There's a, there's a lot of evidence that a whole range of different organisms around the world are moving their latitudinal distributions as a consequence of changing climate. Now. If we're talking about a wholesale movement of the Great Barrier Reef, that really is not possible. And the thing that we haven't talked about in this so far is the dual effects of climate change, that being increasing temperature and also ocean acidification. So while generally speaking, the effects of temperature are most severe in the north, but not in this particular event, and you would expect that corals living further south would experience generally cooler water. The opposite is true in terms of ocean acidification, where generally the impacts of ocean acidification are worse at higher latitudes. So really what might happen is that reefs are going to be increasingly squeezed into a very small area where they can flourish, where temperatures are going to be too hot in the north and ocean acidification is preventing them from growing in the south. So it is very complicated. There is certainly evidence that some things are shifting. And so we're getting unprecedented amounts of corals growing in Sydney Harbour, for example. But I don't think we can take too much from that to assume that the Great Barrier Reef will just exist further south in the future. Yeah, no worries. And there's a broader question that's come up a few times, you know, uh, we're focusing on the Great Barrier Reef uh, with this with this marine heat wave. Um, but of course, coral reefs around the world are suffering due to climate change. Um, are you able to reflect a bit on that? Like how does what's happening with the reef compared to around the world? Is the same pattern happening everywhere? Is Or is our reef in a, some hot patch somehow? Yeah, so at the moment, there's not a, I haven't actually seen any results from surveys from other coral reefs around the world to see whether this event has actually impacted reefs, other reefs in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, if you look at the temperature um, accumulation based on those NOAA satellite images, um, it did seem that it was very patchy around the world. So. In the previous 2016 and 2017 events, virtually nowhere in the world was spared. We know that there were some small areas of reef, for example, the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef, which escaped, but it was a very widespread event. But also be aware that this summer is not over by any means. It, it's the reassuring to see that the temperatures are cooling down on the Great Barrier Reef and in the Coral Sea, but it's all due to sort of complexities in the weather and it's probably very different in different parts of the world. Great. Um, and so Jake has a great question in Zoom, um, seeing if you can debunk some myths that people um, have talked about in terms of other causes of co coral bleaching. Like I know that um, coral bleaching is a gene generic stress pattern in corals that can be caused by other things, but on a mass scale, um, you know, uh, can things like rainfall, sunscreens, uh, other forms of direct pollution, um, can they cause these sort of mass coral bleachings or is it just temperature and climate? Yeah, so you're right in that bleaching is a common stress response among corals and other zoosanthellate organisms to virtually any stress. But 
I would argue that when you're seeing mass bleaching on this scale, really the only viable explanation for that is a large scale change in the um, overall temperature. Now, to further reinforce that, when we actually look at the correlations, spatial and temporal, between the accumulated heat stress and the amount of bleaching that you actually record on any given reef, there is a very good relationship. So it's not like there's a lot of unexplained variation in bleaching that could be attributable to other factors. So temperature is really the main story here. Yeah, interesting times. Um, so I think a lot of times it's kind of, we can't see what's happening with the, um, you know, uh, carbon emissions, we can't see tech, we can't see heat. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's, I understand why people look to other more direct forms of um, pollution otherwise to kind of explain these things. Um, so uh, other questions coming through, really appreciate them from everyone. Um, uh, kind of more kind of questions about uh, specific biodiversity questions from, uh, from some types, like Yvette has asked um, whether um, reefs that go through bleaching and survive, whether they're kind of inbuilt with some sort of um, enhanced ability to survive warmer temperatures. And there was another question um, from someone asking about whether there were specific, uh, specific species of corals that do better under stress than others. Yeah, so those are very good questions. Now, we have actually even worked on that ourselves and shown that on a reef that has experienced bleaching, when it experiences the same level of heat stress subsequently, the level of bleaching that you see the second time around is much, much lower. But on one hand, you can take away from that that these corals are now potentially more resilient to any future climate events. But you have to remember what we've actually done is killed off all the really vulnerable corals. So it's, it's a real phenomenon where you can see lower levels of bleaching for a given level of heat stress moving forward. But in order for that to play out, generally what's happened is we've driven a lot of the really vulnerable coral species to extinction. So it's not actually a good news story in that sense. But there are going to be uh, a bunch of corals which are much more resilient and much better able to withstand these um, high temperatures that will come to dominate on reefs moving forward. Now, we often assume that they're gonna be the corals which are the last to bleach, but remember that some of the re really robust, massive corals, which you know only bleach during really, really extreme events are quite slow growing. And so really what might also happen is it's the really weedy corals that can just bounce back after these bleaching events that could become more abundant. Now, I know that doesn't directly ask you, answer your question, but I would say that coral communities are changing as a consequence of changing environmental conditions, but the specific makeup of who's going to be the winners and who's going to be the losers is a little bit complex. And it depends on both the frequency and also the severity of these disturbance events moving forward. Thanks, Morgan. Um, got a uh, question about uh, the fluorescing corals from Chris on Facebook, um, noting that there's a bit of community confusion about uh, what the change in colour means. Is it good? Is it bad? Um, you know, what's it mean in terms of the microalgae? Um, yeah, could you tell us more about that process? Yeah, so when people talk about coral bleaching, everyone immediately assumes we're talking about a bright white coral. And so there is confusion around when you see some photos of corals which can show these really pretty but pale pinks, blues, greens. Um, now, when the corals are in this state, it is still bleaching. They have tend to generally have lost a large proportion of the photosynthetic zooxanthellae in their tissues, which allow them to obtain their um, energy. So they're still bleaching. Now, I would say that the jury is still out on whether those corals that are fluorescing are going to ultimately die or not. We know that that fluorescence that you sometimes see is a short-term response 
which could be a really good survival strategy for those corals. Um, but it could be that, you know, ultimately they spend a lot of energy and it doesn't actually work out if the, if the temperatures are too prolonged. So the, the take home from that is that any decline in the level, overall level of pigmentation on those corals is evidence that they're experiencing stress and bleaching. There is some important information coming out and we actually have a paper that's just been accepted in current biology talking explicitly about this fluorescence of corals. And it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon, but it relates more to the type of thermal stress that the coral experiences. And I would think it's premature to say whether these corals are any more or less likely to die. Thanks, Morgan. Um, the question about um, with this bleaching event, obviously there was a lot of heat in the water um, in that same sort of climatic condition that caused the bushfires, everything's getting hotter. So why was it that certain areas, you know, like out from Cairns and further north, how come they avoided bleaching this time? So when you actually look carefully at those satellite derived products, which look at accumulated heat stress, you can see that there is a lot of variability. It's not that the entire length of the Great Barrier Reef is littered with dark red. So there is some variability. Remembering this is a vast system and there's all sorts of various um, climatic features and also hydrodynamic features that impact on the actual temperatures you experience in any given location. Now, when you actually relate the amount of bleaching to the specific temperatures experienced at a particular location, there's a pretty good relationship. And so it just so happens that, you know, due to upwellings or particular weather features, some areas just didn't get as hot as other areas. And so that really does explain these patterns of bleaching. And so there's a certain level of uncertainty in any of these events as to which reefs will or will not bleach. Thanks, Morgan. And so we know that bleaching doesn't necessarily mean that the corals die. So when will we know more about, you know, the severity of this bleaching in terms of mortality for corals? Yeah, so on one hand, we can use the information that I showed you from the 2016 event to show that when you experience the level of bleaching that Terry has shown at those more severely affected reefs, there generally is a uh, high level of subsequent mortality. But what we need to do to really document the mortality is actually go out in the aftermath of these bleaching events to actually go back to the same locations where we did the in-water surveys and look at the actual level of coral loss. Now, at this stage, I'm planning to do that, but who knows how long the shutdowns due to the COVID-19 might happen, we might not get that chance to do that. But at some point later in this year, I hope to go back to those reefs and actually provide that information on what level of mortality did occur on these reefs. Yeah, that'll be super interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing that. And hopefully that temperature due to that cyclone system that didn't cross the coast will mean that corals will cool down and we have minimal mortality, but obviously we'll wait and see. Um, so a question from Isaac on Zoom is about um, management practices that can help provide, uh, maintain reaches, reefs for the future. Like what are the future traditional and contemporary management practices to maintain a reef? Good reflect on that. Yeah, so the foremost thing I want to emphasize is that given the recurrence of these major mass bleaching events, which are unequivocally linked to climate change, our foremost strategy has to be to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. That's not to say that in particular locations there aren't a lot of other major direct anthropogenic pressures on the reef and we need to uphold all the excellent management actions that are already in place such as you know the zoning on the Great Barrier Reef which really restricts certain destructive activities and um, exploitative activities in certain areas. We need to uphold all of that so that we give the reef the best chance to bounce back. But unless we address emissions, 
um, we're going to see recurrent mass bleaching like we've seen in the last few years. And that is going to lead to an overwhelming decline in the condition of, Great Bar of the Great Barrier Reef and reefs globally. Scary stuff. Thanks, Morgan. Um, so a related question is from Ingrid. Um, so obviously we need to address climate change and there's a lot of uh, kind of concern in the community that renewables may not be reliable enough to power the whole energy system. Um, you know, obviously you're not a um, climate or energy scientist, but from your experience, like, uh, what have you been reading about the power of renewables to power, um, you know, a green future that can sustain, you know, coal reefs around the world? Yes, it's, it's far from my area of expertise, but as I understand it, especially living in North Queensland, there is no reason why we can't be 100% reliant on renewables, at least for our energy needs, okay? Some of the other more complex um, solutions still are outstanding relating to how we're going to do international air travel and those sorts of things based solely on renewables. Um, but things are changing very quickly. Um, the the, the um, capability of batteries is changing all the time. Um, and so we really do need to see some major leadership and some changes in the fundamental transport and energy policies to allow renewables to really flourish. Here, here, and that's what we're here to try and do. And so we've got five more minutes of questions before we take some action um, by calling, I'm gonna be calling the prime minister on my phone and with all of you live, and then we're gonna get everyone to call your MPs using a handy link to be able to look up um, the phone number um, right after this call. So I'll just answer a few more questions. There's been so many, so we're not gonna be able to get to them all, but thank you for submitting them. Um, uh, we have a really great question from Jen Jones on Zoom, um, asking how are the researchers collaborating with traditional owners for coral monitoring activities? And I guess, you know, broadening into other um, areas of management in the marine park. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important um, point. And I would love to be able to say that we are engaging at a very, very high level, but um, for this, these particular surveys, um, it was very much undertaken at short notice and conducted largely by the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies um, with some substantial logistical support um, and personnel from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. We are, however, very um, aware of the contributions that can be made by traditional owners and are engaging with them on a lot of other um, projects and definitely want to increase that in the future. Thanks, Morgan. Um, so the question from uh, another David, great name. Um, what impact will there be on, next, on this year's spawning event as a result of um, you know, this bleaching? Yeah, so again, all I can do is make some uh, assumptions based on what we've seen in the previous events. And so in the aftermath of major bleaching in 2016 and 2017, we saw a definite reduction in the amount of uh, coral settlement. And so that would suggest that there were impacts associated with those thermal uh, marine heat waves on the actual reproductive capacity of those corals. So I would suggest on those reefs where we saw the really severe bleaching, there was likely to have been really extreme temperatures. And even if some of those corals do, did survive, it's probably going to impact on their reproduction for this year. Now, I don't know about the really specific locations you're talking about, but as I pointed out, some of those reefs off Cairns, the outermost reefs off Cairns, look like they were largely spared during this particular event. Thanks, Morgan. There's been a few questions about money. So obviously um, the government uh, has put a lot of money on the table in the past for various quote unquote reef saving uh, projects. Um, you know, you don't need to comment too much, but like, you know, what generally has that gone into? Uh, how is it addressing the issue of coral bleaching? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, there has been a lot of money put on the table to address um, pressures on the Great Barrier Reef and also try and uh, ad advance some of the potential solutions to 
directly address things like climate change. But really the thing I want to emphasize is that we need to maintain all the um, really excellent work on direct management, but we also definitely need to address the root cause of this problem, that being the emissions. So, you know, I am very much involved in aspects of research related to things like trying to address outbreaks of crown of thorns starfish, and I believe that those sorts of actions will definitely contribute to the resilience of the reef and allow them to allow the reef um, to recover in the aftermath of mass bleaching events. But the best thing we can do is stop these mass bleaching events from occurring or at least reduce the incidence and severity of these events now. Mm. And Morgan, do you think there's an opportunity for you know government looking to get people back into work after the economic downturn of uh, COVID? Like, do you think there's opportunity for those sort of job rich um, activities, whether it's in monitoring or kind of thoughts, is there areas for this kind of like blue jobs to come from this sort of funding, maybe? Yes, yeah, so I think, you know, when we're talking about reinvesting money and we recognise that the Great Barrier Reef is one of our most important natural assets, then we need to think of things which will be a win both economically and environmentally. And so exactly as you said, let's, let's be a little bit more conscious of the green aspect of the jobs that we're promoting moving forward. Great, thanks Morgan. Um, so we have come to the end of our Q&A section, but the seminar, the webinar isn't over, so stick around. Um, we're gonna be taking all the sort of devastation, sadness um, uh, from this kind of presentation. Obviously we all love the reef and we wanna protect its future and it's we're not gonna be able to protect it unless we take action together. And so um, obviously the mining and burning of fossil fuels is the culprit here and the way that we, you know, manage to phase that out and embrace the clean renewable energy future is by using the democratic power that we have to um, pressure our politicians to do the right thing. And so politicians, like any of us, are subject to pressure. We've been able to get lots of wins over the years from, um, you know, uh, banning the dumping in, uh, dr of dredge spoil into the Great Barrier Marine Park when it was already approved. Uh, we've been able to, you know, stop new coal ports that were going to be really harmful to inshore reef areas. And so we can get the strong climate policies that we need, but it's not going to happen unless we, um, you know, apply lots of pressure. And so what I'm going to do now is call up the Prime Minister's office and we're going to convey the message from the hundreds of people on the call right now. And then what I'm going to get to do is share a link so that you can all, after this call ends, call your local federal MP. Um, and if you're overseas, you know, call your um, relevant um, power authorities um, because this is a global issue and we all need to take action. And it's clear that, you know, Australia as the custodians of the reef need to be on the front foot because how do we expect countries like China and India to take the action to protect our reef if we're not doing our fair share as well. So I'm going to call the Prime Minister's office right this second um, and see how we go. I've got it saved on my phone. I'm Scott Morrison. We're on first name basis. I put on loudspeaker. Prime Minister's office. Oh, hello there. My name's David. I'm hoping to pass a message on to the Prime Minister. Yes, of course, David. Thank you. Um, so my name's David and I work with the Australian Marine Conservation Society here in Queensland. Um, we've just at the end of a webinar with um, Professor Morgan Pratchett, where we've been um, hearing about the impacts of climate change on the mass coral bleaching event of 2020, which is obviously really concerning. And, you know, there are hundreds of people on this call on Zoom and also on Facebook, and we're all um, desperately um, urging the Prime Minister to use this time of COVID to, you know, invest in renewable and clean industries that will create jobs and also lead to a cleaner world where we can sustain a Great Barrier Reef into the future. Um, so we're really asking them to choose coral and not coal and other polluting industries as we move forward. Are you able to pass on that message? Oh, yeah, definitely, David. I'll definitely pass it on. Thank you so much. Okay, okay thank you very much. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so it's as easy as calling a number 
and um, getting it out. So I'm going to share our link. So basically, you can. Uh, um, so I'm sending it in Zoom and my colleagues will share it on Facebook as well. And so basically you can use our tool by putting in your postcode and it'll come up with the phone number of the uh, MP of your area. And give them a call, there's some talking points there, introduce yourselves, be really polite, they're just, it'll mainly be the receptionist that you get to. Um, and, and really just explain from the heart like why you really care about this issue. Because if they don't think anyone cares, they're not going to take action, right? And they're obviously really distracted with what's happening with coronavirus. So, you know, don't be afraid to um, acknowledge that issue and, you know, say that, you know, this is the time to be investing in the good projects that create jobs and protect the future of our reef and, you know, the 60,000 jobs that rely on it for its future too. I know there are many people in Cairns that might be on the call that, you know, work in the industry and we need to protect their livelihoods. So um, that's exciting. Hope everyone enjoyed that. And I encourage you all to take action after this call immediately. And there's a section on the web page where you can let us know how it goes. And so we can keep a track of how many phone calls we went because we really need to be able to scale our efforts so that they're feeling the pressure from all sides. Great. And so the fun doesn't stop there. Um, so after this call, we're going to have the video uploaded to Facebook. And so um, you will be able to share it with your friends, tag them in in the comments and you know take all that sort of action and share it around and it'll be there so that people can uh, um, have their answers question questions answered like we've done in this call which is amazing and if you're keen to take further action with us um, to address the climate crisis and protect the future of our great barrier reef i'd really encourage you to stay in contact with us at the australian marine conservation society um, we've got a whole suite of webinars planned for the next little while to be able to provide everyone with the skills and confidence to be able to take action on this issue. So our first training webinar is coming up next week for people in far North Queensland. Um, we're trialing it with a smaller group to be able to have, um, and this is all about having conversations about our reef and climate change in the age of COVID-19. So it's a much more sensitive time and we need to be able to adjust our um, conversation skills to be able to meet the, meet the um, time that we're living in. So we're going to be starting that next week in far north Queensland and then the week after we're going to um, have learned from our smaller group and take it to a bigger audience where we can have everyone on a Zoom call um, and um, break it down into different rooms where we can. Zoom is amazing technology, we're still getting used to it, but um, hopefully we'll be able to, um, you know, use it for a bit of bigger audience. So we're kind of those basic conversation skills on how to talk about the big issues with your friends, your family and your neighbours and especially during the constrained time that we live in. And so we're also going to drop the link for that one um, in here. And we're going to send an email out to everyone who RSVP'd for the Zoom call so that you have all these details. Um, but I encourage you to get onto our mailing list um, through one of the petitions that we've got online if you're not on there already so that you can be up to date on all this stuff. Um, so, and then, you know, for, um, so we, we're taking action by calling up MPs and we're going to be having conversations with our friends and family so that we can grow the movement of people acting and caring about the Great Barrier Reef into the future. Um, and I'd also encourage you, like I know that many people are feeling the impacts of, of um, COVID-19 right now, so they may not have a lot of money lying around, but for those who can, um, you know, AMCS is a, a registered charity and we can only um, continue to do what we do with donations from our supporters like yourselves. Um, so um, we'd encourage you to um, donate if you can. We've got um, an online donation form that I'm going to be popping in the comments as well. Um, and we'd love um, any donation that you can spare, even if it's just $10, um, so that we can power our important work. Um, so thank you for, um, for that. So yeah, to summarize, um, you know, as soon as we end this call, I'd encourage everyone to jump um, using that link to call your MPs, um, you know, speak from the heart. And, and if you have other people in your home right now, get them to make a call as well. Politicians need to hear that hundreds of people care about this issue. Um, use the links and let us know how you go. We're going to send you an email with um, updates on how to take action with us into the future. Um, and if you're not already, uh, make sure you're on our mailing list at marineconservation.org.au. So thank you all for your support. Um, groups like ANCS and the Australian Marine Conservation Society, we cannot do this alone. Like the, Climate change is obviously a global issue, um, but our reef is the jewel in the crown of coral reefs around the world. And we have an extra responsibility 
um, to take all the action that we can to protect its future. And that means making sure our politicians know that we are demanding action, um, even you know, when there's so much going on. So um, we finished five minutes early, which is great. Um, I'm a fast talker, so apologies for that one. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone taking the time to be on the call today. Um, we've all got so much going on in our lives. We're all coming from our homes normally instead of being out at work. And so, you know, let's use this opportunity to connect with each other. And then once this is all over, let's reconnect with the beautiful reef that we love. Let's get back up to um, the reef coast and, and go for a dive and check out all the beautiful, um, you know, turtles and um, anemones and all that sort of thing. Um, because um, it's still beautiful and we've got to fight for its future. So thank you all so much and um, stay in touch. We'll see you very soon. And thank you so much again to Morgan. We really appreciate your time today. It's, I've got a lot out of this and I hope our supporters have too. Thank you, David. And thanks for all your excellent work and the entire Australian Marine Conservation Society. And I'll just echo that, that the Great Barrier Reef is still an amazing place. So as soon as COVID-19 is all over and things settle down, make sure you go and pay a visit. Awesome. Love it, Morgan. So talk to you soon. Take care.